Okay. Well, again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Hala Aloui, and on behalf of Atmosphere Press, I am so excited to introduce you to today's holiday season event, which is featuring both literary fiction and poetry. Today, you can find the perfect gift for any of the book-minded people in your lives, so I definitely recommend you check out these books online. We'll be hearing from Matt Edwards reading from Icarus Never Flew Round Here, which was released September 24th. Alan Gartenhouse reading from Balsamic Moon, which was released October 25th, and Damian White reading from I Made a Place for You, which was released November 1st. All three authors' books can be purchased from online retailers and from select um, independent bookstores, and the books can also be ordered on Atmosphere Press's website at atmospherepress.com forward slash books. Please see the links in the chat. At the end of the event, we will also have time for any audience questions. So during the readings, if you have a question for one of our authors, including authors, if you have a question for one another, um, just go ahead and type that in the chat and I'll make sure it gets asked. And then during the actual reading itself, please stay muted to keep extraneous sound at a minimum. Of course, certainly feel free to use the chat for praise and comments. And one last note, we at Atmosphere Press appreciate your support today and every day. If you have a manuscript of your own, we would love to read it. So feel free to submit your work to books at atmosphereprest.com. Again, thank you so much for tuning in today to support Matt, Alan, and Damien. And let's start off with our first reader, who is Matt Edwards. Matt, author of Ways and Truths and Lives, was born and raised in Boise, Idaho, formerly the Northwest's best kept secret, where he developed an affinity for literature both the challenge of understanding it and the potential to be understood through it. This propelled Matt to study English at Boise State University and devote himself to teaching high school English in the Bo Boise area since 2006. Matt now enjoys sharing his life of passions with his wife and their one and only son. In his free time, if Matt's not training for marathons, he's writing fiction and poetry, mostly about gods and fathers and good strong drinks. Learn more at mattedwardsauthor.com. In Matt's second novel, Icarus Never Flew Around Here, years of living and ranching in the lonely and desolate Oregon high desert has given Dale plenty of time to think. Dale's inevitable descent into frustration and erratic behavior illustrates the irony that so many of us are guilty of when we try to emulate the idea of God that we've developed in our mind based mostly on intuition we end up becoming servile to an idea, the results of which often ripple and reverberate in disastrous ways. And with that, Matt, take it away. All right, thanks everyone. I'll try to give you a little bit of taste. And this book uh, is cut up into lots of short vignettes. And so I'll see how many I can get done in my allotted time. This chapter is called Curses. Oop. Check that, I'm gonna back up. This one's called Use. The dirt trickles in around the new cedar fence post as Dale's shovel avoids all sizable rocks until the hole is nearly filled. As he scrapes the ground flush with the edge of his shovel, something catches his eye amongst the scattered rocks. He toes it with the shovel blade. Its weight and consistency are different from the other rocks. He crouches down to take a closer look. Its color is essentially that of the rocks, but its shape is much more uniform and exact. He fingers it back and forth. Dale looks over his shoulder and sees Amelia, his one and only red pole staring at him a mere 10 feet away. What? Amelia continues to stare. Turning back around, Dale decides to pick up the mysterious object. It is light in his hands, and as he turns the turnip-shaped object over and over, Dale notices a small opening, previously caked with dirt, revealing the object to be hollow. What are you? Dale asks, then pauses to look over his shoulder at Amelia. Mind your own business. Dale hurriedly scatters the remaining rocks around the base of the fence post, gets up and marches toward the house. What do you make of this? Dale asks, the small turnip shaped thing resting in the palm of his hand. Janice looks up from the pages of Jane Eyre to basking in the remnants of the late morning sun and turns in her armchair to squint at the object. What is it? I don't know, that's why I'm asking you. Dale shoves his hand closer to Janice's face. 
Her eyes scan back and forth. It sure looks like something though, don't it? Yeah, I'm thinking it's Indian. What makes you say that? Well, it looks old, first of all. I was also noticing these smudges. It looks like it was painted. See those little pictures? Dale runs his fingers across the object's belly. Oh yeah. Janice cranes her neck forward, her chin almost touching Dale's fingertips. What do you think it was used for? What do you mean? I mean, it had to have been used for something. It just can't. Janice pauses and glances up at the ceiling. Be something. You think so? You don't think it could just be art or some kind of decoration? No, I think it's a tool of some kind. Besides, if it was art or something like that, it would still be used. It would have a purpose. Oh yeah, and what would that be, Miss Fancy Pants? Dale jabs his fist into his hip, elbow jutting out. It would be for looking at, for appreciating. Maybe these smudges tell a story, Janice says. Her eyes follow her finger as it moves from left to right. Yeah? Yeah. You know, nothing is made without a purpose. You sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. Janice pulls back and sits up straight. How do you know? I just do. Well, what would you do if you didn't? Huh? Dale just stares back. Ah, forget it. Janice shoes him away with a wave of her hand and turns back to the sunlit pages of her book. This one's curses. Janice dog ears a page in Jane Eyre and closes it as she sighs. She turns off her bedside lamp and sees that Dale's is still on. Dale, you ready to go to sleep? Janice whispers, noticing that Dale is propped up on pillows, looking straight ahead. Dale, she says more sternly this time. Almost, Dale answers faintly, but still with a tinge of gravel in his voice. You all right? Yeah, I'm just thinking. Uh-oh, Janice says as she squirms further under the covers and rests her head on her pillow. We're all in trouble when that starts happening. A moment goes by without a response. Janice turns to look at Dale. He's backlit, backlit by the lamp, so only his outline is clearly visible. We're supposed to be cursed, right? Dale finally spouts out. Huh? Janice's brows scrunch up. Cursed. Dale looks at Janice. In the Bible, it says we're cursed. Since when have you been reading the Bible? I haven't. That's why I'm asking. Well, yeah, Janice's expression softens. After Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, they were punished by God. And how were they punished? Men have to spend their days toiling the earth and women have to suffer the pains of childbirth. That's what I thought, Dale says, pointing at her last words. So? Dale pauses for a moment before asking, would you consider this curse part of what it means to be a human? What do you mean? Janice asks, rising from her reclined position. I mean... Do you think a man is not a man if he doesn't work his land and a woman is not a woman if she don't go through the pain of childbirth? Janice swallows hard as she turns her gaze toward the window. I don't know, Dale. I hadn't thought about it like that. I was just thinking, if everybody's cursed, but somehow you and me weren't cursed, well, I guess I was trying to figure out what that would mean or why that would be. Why do you say we're not cursed? Dale looks down at his hands and starts tracing the pattern on the comforter with his left forefinger. Because you're not able to have kids, Dale takes a glance at her reaction, and I like toiling the earth, as they say. It don't feel like a punishment, His eyes, he, he says as his eyes return to his finger. Do you think I like not being able to have children on my own? Of course not. And don't you think that sounds like a pretty bad curse? Yes, of course, but, but what? But technically, it's not the curse. You can technically go fuck yourself, Dale. Janice turns back, her back to him, lies completely prone, and thrusts the comforter up under her ear. I'm sorry, I didn't want to compare or bring up negative thoughts. I've just been thinking about this a lot lately. The point I was trying, yeah, what was your point, Janice snarls. I guess it's more like the idea I get stuck on is, if God wanted to curse all people, and we're not cursed, at least not cursed in the same way as other people, then what could God be trying to tell us? I guess it comes down to not knowing whether this is all a good thing or a bad thing. Janice blinks a few times, then asks, since when do you believe in God? I never said I believed in God, but if he's even a possibility, then I guess that's enough reason to fear him. I think it's natural to fear things we don't understand, Janice says, turning to face the ceiling. I don't know if how I'm feeling is natural, Dale answers, then stares at the palms of his hands. I think I got time for one or two more. Absolutely, yeah. All right. Just making sure we're not cutting in here. All right. 
This one's one of my favorite passages, partly because it's almost sort of a true story that I could maybe explain later. This one's called Angels. Dale walks along Highway 20 with his left thumb extended, a rolled up wool blanket under his right arm. The mid-morning sun casts a long shadow warped by the steep camber of the shoulder, marching to the cadence of boots crunching gravel. He turns his head at the sound of a slowing vehicle behind him, cautiously stepping down the embankment at the sight of the mid 80s wagoneer. The passenger side window buzzes down, revealing a woman behind the wheel the sleeves of a faded Adrian High School sweatshirt pushed up to her elbows. You need a ride? Yeah, if you're heading this way, Dale says, gesturing to the west. I am, get in. Dale opens the passenger door and climbs in. Thanks, I owe you one. Yeah, you do. My name's Sheila, she says, extending her hand. Dale, he says, shaking it. So what you doing out here? It doesn't look like you got much with you. My car broke down at Moon Reservoir, started walking this morning. No phone, Sheila asks, checking her mirrors before accelerating. Nope. Ah, geez, that doesn't sound like fun. How far of a walk was that? Oh, I'm not sure. What time is it anyway? Nearly 9.30, Sheila says with a quick glance at her small silver watch. Yeah, I'm betting it was 10 miles or so. I think it's 15 by car, but I walk straight north as the crow flies. Dale draws a line in the air with his finger. Wow, you need anything to drink? I got this bottle of water right here. Sorry, that's all. No, I'm all right. You sure? Yeah. Dale fixes his gaze out the passenger's side window as Sheila steals frequent glances at him, hands maintaining 10 and 2. Want to know why I picked you up? Sheila asks abruptly. Sure, Dale musters. Every time I drive through here, I'm in awe of how desolate it is. You can go miles without seeing another soul. Try living out here. No, thanks. It's much more comfort and known to know I can just drive through it. Anyhow, it reminds me of this time I swear I was picked up by angels. What? Dale finally turns from the window to look at Sheila. Yeah, when I was a teenager, I got caught walking home in a downpour. I was leaving a Bible study, and I couldn't call anybody because, you see, this was way before cell phones. Way before. Sheila nods at Dale with a smile. And sure enough, about a mile or so into it, a couple pulls up in a white car. They ask me, you need a ride? And I knew no teenage girl should take a ride from strangers. But standing there in that instant, all I could think about was how cold I was. My wet clothes clinging to my body. So I said, yes, and got in. And they took me home. So why do you think they were angels? Dale asks with scrunched brows. Oh, well, a couple of things. One, Sheila keeps count on her fingers. When I told them where I lived, they said it was on their way. But I swear the car had to do a U-turn when they offered me a ride. So you see, they either lied to me to be my savior, or I would have remembered it wrong. Lying angels makes for a more interesting story. Maybe, but the other fishy thing about it was, Sheila holds up a second finger, when I told them where I went to church, they said they went there too, even though I'd never seen them or their car before. Hmm, that's it? What do you mean? Those two things are why you think they were angels, Dale asks, one eyebrow arched. Well, no, Sheila shakes her head. But the last one's the hardest to explain. You kind of had to be there, you know? Go on. Well, it was just a simple feeling. What was? Well, in that moment they were, that they were backing out of my driveway, just before my mom started calling me a tramp for hopping in a stranger's car and how my wet clothes weren't leaving much to the imagination, I felt this strange sense of, un sense of understanding come to me like a veil had been lifted, like I had experienced something special. And in that moment, I knew or at least the 14-year-old version of me did, Sheila says with a shrug. Dale's vision racks focus to the southern horizon. You say it came to you? Sorry, what? Sheila squints at Dale. That special feeling, it came to you? Oh yeah, she, Sheila nods in slow succession, and it had a hard time leaving too. What do you mean? Dale asks, squinting back at Sheila. Well, I'm not sure I believe all that stuff about angels anymore, seeing as how I've never had any another experience like it but I sure remember that feeling and it had me convinced for the longest time. Yeah, I bet, Dale says as he looks at his hands. So anyway, when I saw you walking on the side of the road this morning in the most lonesome stretch of highway in the US, Sheila's hand glides across the few in front of them. I thought of a 14 year old soaking wet girl clutching her Bible and I figured I'd help. Are you an angel? Dale asks, ha, if only. Call that good. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. I feel like I'm 
questioning right alongside Dale sometimes, you know, he brings up these good points and I just want to meditate on them. But <laughs> um, before I can do that, uh, reading next tonight or today, I should say, depending on your time zone, uh, up next is Alan Gardenhouse. Alan served as an educator at the New Orleans Museum of Art and Smithsonian Institution and as a director of Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle. A recipient of an Alden B. Dow Creativity Fellowship, he created and was the publishing editor of the Docent Educator magazine. His fiction has appeared in numerous literary journals, including Broad River Review, Entropy Magazine, Euphony Journal at the University of Chicago, Ignatian Literary Magazine at the University of San Francisco, and the Santa Fe Literary Review. His nonfiction has been published by Running Press, Smithsonian Press, and Writer's Workshop Review. In Allen's debut novel, Balsamic Moon, Doreen Williams, an African-American single mother, and Richard Gerard, a reclusive gay man, are aloof and even suspicious of each other. But when Hurricane Katrina hits, they're sent scrambling into a cramped attic where, together, they face tests of grueling heat, dwindling supplies, worries about loved ones, and the struggle to keep living. I will let the story unfold with Alan's reading. Um, Alan, I think you are still muted. Try it again. Can you hear there me There you now? are. Yes, perfect. Okay. I, I <laughs> got a sticky button there. I'm very sorry. <laughs> he had the lightning dream again. The last flash so intense it struck him awake. Richard blinked hard, took two deep breaths, and reached for his eyeglasses, his fingers adding new smears to old smudges. It was only a few minutes past midnight. He hadn't slept long. His head returned to his sweat-stained, sour-smelling pillow. Stifling heat had continued for weeks without a thing, single thunderstorm to break the cycle. No thunderstorms, no lightning. Richard craved lightning the way a junkie craves drugs. He ached for it, the thrill of it. Glorious white-hot flashes that affirmed his belief in a higher power and interrupted life's unending monotony. But lately, lightning only came to him in dreams taunting him like an itch he couldn't reach, impossible to ignore, impossible to quell. Knowing that sleep would not return, he stood and trudged into the bathroom, wincing when he flicked on the light and caught sight of his reflection in the medicine chest mirror. Dark circles surrounded even darker eyes. He'd once been thought quite handsome. Everyone had said so, leading man material. But at age 59, his features had coarsened his scallow, sallow skin sagged, and his once thick, mahogany-colored hair had thinned, becoming brittle and gray. Threading a path through his dimly lit living room and ignoring old newspapers scattered on the carpeted floor, he passed his favorite high back chair, foregoing it to sit outside on the cooler concrete of the front stoop. The end of August in New Orleans guaranteed jungle heat and humidity and time that moved more slowly than its thick, moist air. Though his house lacked air conditioning, he rarely sought relief outdoors, unless it was very late and sleep wouldn't come. He enjoyed marveling at those few stars bright enough to compete with city lights, but would only do so when he could linger unnoticed and undisturbed. Tonight, more stars shone than usual. They had less competition. The threat posed by an approaching hurricane had scattered wary neighbors like milkweed on a summer breeze. Reports on the radio warned that the storm in the Gulf had grown in size and strength, now more than 450 miles across and packing winds of over 160 miles per hour. She was said to be pushing a surge of water 25 feet and more into the air. Comparisons were being made to Hurricane Andrew which had destroyed every part of South Florida it touched. But with one important difference, this storm was far larger than Andrew. Richard pictured the storm a circular saw lying on its side and a, an enormous spinning blade approaching landfall. Though its precise route remained in question, all day a mocking little tune played in his head. The wind began to switch 
the house to pitch and suddenly the hinges started to unhitch. His nightmare was being trapped in the house as it exploded, peppered and pierced by countless wooden slivers, but it wasn't death he feared most. It was survival. The dread of being left physically devastated and far worse still, homeless. He had known little beyond these walls for years. And while his retreat and isolation had resulted in a life untended, a life of neglect and indifference, with mirrors that only reflected the past, it had also rooted him firmly in place. At least the discomforts here were familiar and predictable. Too agitated to sleep, Doreen dressed, shut her dog in the bathroom with a big bowl of water, and drove to the French Quarter craving beignets, a guilty pleasure, especially during times of stress. When finished, she left the cafe and crossed Decatur Street, choosing to take a stroll around Jackson Square, admiring the urban park and the Pontalba apartment building with its lacy iron galleries. As she stood, blotting perspiration from her bronze neck, wondering how the night could be so deathly still with such a ferocious storm churning in the gulf, a thin female voice interrupted her quiet reflection. Young lady, venez, venez ici. Doreen turned. Tucked into a recess of Pirate Alley, a slight elderly woman sat at a small folding table, motioning with both hands. Illuminated only by the alley's gas lamps and dressed in black, she had gone unnoticed, blending into the shadows. The woman wore large dark glasses, which Doreen assumed to be an affectation in the dim flickering lamplight. Her cardigan sweater seemed equally unnecessary in such sultry weather. Doreen strained to make out the words on the hand-lettered sign sitting atop the woman's table. Tarot readings with mercy. Remembering that the theme of her sisterhood meeting at church had been doing the good work, she walked over and pushed a dollar bill into the old woman's glass jar. But I did not ask you for money, the woman protested as Doreen began to leave. And now you walk away from me, why? Does the idea of talking with me frighten you? Doreen squared her shoulders, spun around and faced the woman. Do I look scared? I wouldn't know. The old woman removed her dark glasses, revealing eyes covered with whitish clouds. Her enlarged left eye turned at an odd angle. She picked up a white cane and pointed to a dog cloaked in a service harness and snoring softly at her feet. I am blind, I see what others cannot. Doreen bowed her head. But why then did you ask me over? I sensed something about you, heard it in your walk. Sensed what, she asked. I'm not sure, a concern, a sadness, perhaps disappointment. I felt you had questions for the cards. The old woman's voice rattled a bit as if she needed to clear her throat. Have you, have you questions? Doreen sighed with resignation as she dropped onto the small chair before her. She fanned her flushed face with her hand. She could see that the woman was quite old. Can the cards tell me when this heat will break? The woman frowned. Tarot does not predict the weather. I only know that with the approach of a balsamic moon, something big is coming. But that wasn't your question, was it? She held out a deck of dog-eared, oversized cards that appeared even larger in her tiny hands. Shuffle them. Let me read them for you. Tarot readings with mercy. Doreen recited aloud the words on the woman's sign. So you color your readings with kindness? Hardly, the old woman huffed, pulling her sweater more tightly around her narrow chest. The cards are the cards. Mercy is my name. Well, actually, my true name is Merci. My mother lost three before me. Doreen received the deck of cards from Mercy's bent neural fingers. But if you're blind, how can you see them? You will shuffle and I will lay them out. Then I'll ask you to tell me about them. We'll make this reading together. Doreen attempted to return the cards after shuffling only once, but Mercy resisted. No, take your time. Reflect as you shuffle. Think about where you are in life and about the questions you have. You needn't say anything to me, but do shuffle the cards with intention. Place them next to your heart. Make them your own. Are the, Doreen returned the cards to Mercy's hands and gently placed the uh, 
cards in her hand. Are the cards facing me as they did you, the old woman asked. Doreen took the deck and rotated them. They are now. Oh. Mercy dealt the cards, snapping each one as she flicked it from the deck and set it onto the table. The first six she placed in the shape of a cross, the next four in a vertical line beside it, and the final 12 in a horizontal row below all the others. Some of the cards were right side up, others upside down. Once done, she wheezed and drew several labored breaths. Moments later, she leaned forward and whispered, your soul will be touched. My soul will be touched. Doreen shook her head. I don't understand. What does that mean? Mercy smiled slightly, slightly. I don't know. It is the answer to one of your questions. Now hush. She removed her dark glasses and began mumbling an incantation that sounded like gibberish. Finally, she lowered her hands, shaking her head as if responding to silent voices. Perhaps we should not go further with this, she warned. Her expression disturbed. You will not welcome what these cards say. I thought you said you couldn't see. I cannot, but I do sense things. Doreen scoffed, annoyed. You've already gotten me to go this far. Mercy's countenance grew grave as she nodded slowly. Tell me the six cards placed in the middle, if you would. Start with the two that touch one another. Doreen looked down at the cards. One is the Empress, the other is the Hermit. Ah, yes, and their directions. Both are facing me, so I figure they must be, of course, they would be reversed. Okay, reversed. Above them is the world. I guess it's also reversed, as is the fool to the right and the wheel of fortune to the left. Only the hangman at the bottom is not. The old woman shuddered and shook her head, taking a halting breath and moaning softly. She slumped forward. But this is not good. Not good at all. I knew it. I could feel it before you even told me the cards. Quel tragédie. Doreen leaned closer. What is not good? Mercy exhaled. It is for you to listen and decide for yourself. I do not know more than what the cards tell. It seems there is enormous sadness near you. It draws you. This sadness is due to the passing of an empress, a female person of great influence. Someone held most dear. Doreen's jaw clenched. Her mother, a diabetic, had been ill for quite some time, and her health had been failing lately. As for the surrounding influences, above this enormous gloss is a card of material wealth, the world. But you've said it, that it too is in a negative position, which means such matters are in disharmony and will only get worse. Below all this is the hanged man, a card of sacrifice indicating even more that must be given up. More, more of what? What could that be? Mercy hunched her sh narrow shoulders. As I told you, I only know what the cards say. It is up to you to figure out what they mean. All I do know is that you have to give up something precious. And the cards tell that this bad luck, these hard times will not change, Mercy continued. Things do not get better. No change of season. Plus de tristesse. Things will be beyond your control. The bad fortune around you will not go away, but will grow. Doreen stood abruptly, nearly toppling the folding chair on which she sat. Both of her parents were elderly and fragile. Her young son was away from home for the first time at summer camp with bad weather approaching. More of this talk would overwhelm the anxiety she'd already been carrying. Thank you, Miss Mercy. It's late. I'd better be going. Forgive me, she implored. I only read the cards. I do not make the future. No, of course not. Doreen took a $5 bill from her purse and folded it into Mercy's hand. I must go. Good night. As Doreen turned to leave, already working to dismiss everything she'd heard, Mercy called out, do not forget that a storm is on its way and a balsamic moon is coming as well. With cards like yours, you must take care. Be aware, my dear. Prepare. Watch out for the balsamic moon. Thank you very much, Alan. You have such an expressive reading voice. I feel like... <laughs> I don't know, a little afraid. <laughs> I, I mean, I feel like I'm experiencing all these emotions alongside Doreen. And I feel like I just got a really unnerving uh, tarot reading. So luckily thank I you. did not. So <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and our final reader for today is Damien White. 
Damien is a writer from Columbus, Ohio. He is the author of the poetry book, I Made a, po I Made a Place for You, which is his debut collection. After battling two bouts with homelessness, he channeled those experiences into poetry as a way to heal a fractured identity. When not writing, he can be found exploring art galleries, playing tug of war with his pups, traveling, and finding the best coffee in every city. Damien received his BA in sociology from Davidson College. He currently resides in his hometown with his wife and stepchildren. The poetry collection, I Made a Place for You, explores a number of themes, ranging from spirituality and religion to perseverance and humility. The poems in Damien White's debut book dwell less in the realm, realm of imagistic and narrative impulses and more so strive for a higher order statement. The poems are accompanied by illustrations by Francesco Orazzini, which I will be screen, screen sharing as Damien reads. And with that, let's welcome Damien. Thank you, Hala. <clears throat> Super excited to be here. If, after listening to those two guys read, it felt like I was listening to movies, like literally. I felt like I was in movies. Um, coming from poetry, I'm used to writing pithier things. So listening to the volume of their language is, was just phenomenal for me. So and my, one of my first times doing it. So it's amazing. Um, so I'm going to read a selection of poems. Uh, are you going to, you're going to share the images. Uh, the the yes. poem I'm going to start with is called Postmortem. All right. Are the images, uh, is it coming through? Good to go. Okay. Go right ahead. Postmortem. We abracadabra our flaws into a mausoleum of deceit for a semblance of redemption in shelling our leprosy inside. I always love the ones we bury, our uncanny trove of white lies. When I expire, inscribe my epitaph on Pandora's decaying box. Hum melodiously as you adorn my headstone with pastel foliage, let it read. Here lies a man who never died inside. Next poem will be Morning Glow. Trees cascade in stale winds, a new day looms. Time ebbs faithfully with the synchronicity of firefly tales. My praying hands tremble feebly at time's holy alchemy. Lord, thank you for excavating my flaws, allowing me to breathe, amen. Great. God's typewriter. The golden rule of speech is to speak when spoken through. Be a prophet of God's whispers. Sacral thoughts resurrect the spine, unveil the stature of man and poise his pen. Am I the poem, poem or poet? Words linger on my tongue, forlorn and ephemeral. I am more written than writer, an opus of cathartic scribble unfurling my fleshiest truth. We locked eyes. Oh, no, you're right. Go spurt. I prayed on teary pillows for you to exercise the child in me, quiet his relentless torment, and let me be man peacefully. Next up, we have We Locked Eyes. I'm the apathy, apogee of my untruths, a burial ground of missteps, once fertile, yet fashion futile, an elegy of dormant desires. I've made a mockery of mirrors, stood coyly in center frame, deflected in fragility, and grimaced at my reflection. It's the spirit of a man that unearths his ill soul renders him villainous, a mere scrap of himself. We locked eyes, too repulsed to coax a smile on the Saturdays. I am innocent.
To grieve is to soothe an abscess, reconcile the strife between faith and faith, for freedom is no wavering white flag. We build a fortress of validation and guillotine our most precious birthright, innocence. We swoon between slithering temptation, holiness roosting in the umbrage, yet will we emerge victorious? Yes. Heaven's doors open serendipitously, ushered by God's palm itself. Our journey is the price of admission. Good morning. Are we soot, impure, black, and better suited for sadness? Quite the contrary, if all things be considered impartially. We are soil, basil, vital, and better suited for sunshine. Devil bait. Never dare the devil to dance. Be wary of lasciviousness as his swindling hips tango beside Eden's chancel. Never dare the devil to sing. Serpents awaken sacred shockers, reek of sinful incantation under the charmer's murky sky. If you do, cradle your blessings. Summon a soul's worth of prayers now, for no war is won in worry. Dance and sing as you wish. This one is called Hunger Pangs. Depression is gluttonous, a ravenous sin with startling gusto, gorging itself on our pomp and circumstance until revulsed. The last couple here, um, this one is called Purgatory. I am masterfully patient these days. Liberation eclipses the burden of waiting. Finally, unclipped at the helm of bliss, I am still. When you return, I will don growth rings, bowed majestically in serenity. This is my final poem. Um, this one is called Playing God. I gave myself God's glory. He lent it to me briefly. My shoulders buckled beneath its magnificence. To be godly is not to be God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Damien. I always think there's something just so special, especially about hearing uh, a poet's words spoken aloud um, because it's such a kind of cross. Um, I mean, the art of poetry can be such a cross between that spoken and the written. So um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you to Francesco Quartz for providing those illustrations. Um, so we have a little bit of time here for our audience Q&A. So if you have a question, please go ahead and type it in the chat and I will make sure it gets asked. And including authors, if you have any questions for one another, uh, feel free to chime in with those. Um, while everyone is kind of thinking or typing, I actually wanted to pose my own question to each of you to start. Um, I've noticed that a common theme that runs through all three of these books is um, inner contemplation or introspection, either by nature of um, the themes that um, the work talks about or the actual situations the characters are in. Um, so I'd love to hear more about how each of you came to these books or these stories. Was there a lot of internal reflection that had to happen as the writer before you even put the pen down to write? or your fingers to the keyboard? Or um, was the introspection sort of reserved for the characters? Um, yeah, anybody wanna kind of start us off with that? I guess I can go in the same order that we read in. Uh, yeah. I could probably make it a long answer, so I'll attempt to not do that. <laughs> but the basic answer to how this book came about, um, 
stems from driving through the uh, the desert that I depict in the book. Uh, some of my audience members might have done it. Otherwise, the rest of you maybe have never been through between Bend and Burns, Oregon, but it's basically the middle of nowhere. Um, US uh, 20 through there is listed as like the one of the passages I read as one of the loneliest stretches of highway in the United States. It literally goes straight for a long time. You cannot see cars for a long time. So long story short, when I was probably 20 or something like that, I just had the thought of how gosh darn lonely it is out there. And I was just getting into writing creatively in college at the time. And so I just thought it was like a great idea to put a character out there somewhere because it literally feels like when you're scanning the horizon, like it's not unreasonable to conclude that a human has never touched that because it just feels so empty. Um, so basically that was in my brain for a long time. And then uh, as a teacher, I got into um, reading a lot of existentialist literature like Jean-Paul Sartre and Camus and those guys because I was um, basically teaching Albert Camus and Franz Kafka and Dostoevsky and stuff like that. So um, I just realized it'd be a pretty cool idea to like, oh, that idea that I had that I should have a, a very rural person with no for formal education and sort of the only theological knowledge that like an everyday person has, which is, oh yeah, there's a God and stuff, but I don't know much else. Um, to have that person contemplate his existence, I thought would be pretty interesting. And then um yeah so the stranger by albert camus and crime and punishment were pretty big influences i guess um and then i sort of was inspired to do nonlinear storytelling because i'm a big christopher nolan fan as far as connecting to film and so um yeah that's kind of like the fabric of the ideas that that place and that theme and then how to do it nonlinear and have it be not just like a uh, a lame kind of trying to prove that I can do an out of order story, but actually have it be part of the, uh, the message. So kind of like with like maybe something that Damien thinks about is having the form actually be part of the content as well. So, yep, that's, I guess my short answer, if that was even qualifies as a short answer. <laughs> I'm not sure, but. Yeah, no, that's great. I love what you commented about, you know, having a purpose behind the nonlinear nature of the storytelling um, and, you know, for a, a real uh, narrative reason. So, yeah, thank you. Um, Alan, did you want to chime in on this? Well, um, my, um, I loved living in New Orleans. It was a wonderful city of great texture and richness and cultures and music and food and people. Um, I also, I thought of it as sort of like one's first crush. I knew it wasn't the place I was going to grow old with, but every time I think about it and every time um, I've gone back, my heart races just a little bit faster. Watching its destruction and its people in such jeopardy during the hurricane, all of us getting to watch it from afar that, who did, um, it was heart-wrenching, not just heartbreaking. And um, I think I wrote this basically to help me process the loss that I felt. And uh, I did lose a couple of friends in the storm. And it was, um, it was a very hard time, but at the same time, um, inspirational because the city has worked to come back. Its people have worked to come back. And that is the kind of city it is. Um, so that is how this, that was the inspiration for the, for the story. And I went back several times to do research for it too, uh, right after the storm and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like um, I won't give anything away, of course, but to anyone interested, I feel like you can really feel that um, influence, uh, even considering the setting of the story being rather insulated, but the influence of just the area and um, seeing that. So definitely pick up the book so you can experience that as well. Um, Damien, what are you thinking about this? For sure. So uh, for me, I, uh, I, I was actually homeless for three months in San Francisco a few years ago. Um, and I think that that experience 
irrigated a lot of stuff inside of me. So whether that was my relationship with God or lack thereof, my relationship with my family, my relationship with just like the idea of living itself, you know, it's just like I had a lot of questions and I found that the brunch table or like hanging out, out with friends, those weren't the places to like tease out those, those discussions. So this book, I named it, I made a place for you because I literally made a place for the kind of curiosities and the sadness and trauma that I went through and tried to package it in a creative, positive way. So I think that like, I've always wanted to write a book. It's been a, a book list or a bucket list item for me to be able to see my name on the spine of a book on my own book show. So this was like that kind of cathartic moment for me in that way. Um, but also it did serve as like a healing tool for me to be able to not sit and stew with kind of my experience and not know what to do with them or who to run and talk to or to, you know, I've done the therapy and those kind of things. Um, but there was still something missing. Like I still felt like there was a, a inner part of me that I couldn't get, I hadn't got out yet. And this was the best way for me to do it. So that's where the book came from. Mm, yeah, totally. Um, and kind of in a similar vein, we have a question for you, Damien, from Alan. Um, do you see your poems as standalone or can they also work together to create something larger than uh, just the sum of the parts? Yeah, I see them um, definitely creating something larger. Um, I think also to the point earlier about me thinking about like the form, for me having the illustrations and also making the poetry symmetric in a sense to the illustrations, I wanted to add a visual layer there um, onto just the the idea of like having, there are plenty of books that have poem poetry and like doodles or illustrations. But for me, I wanted to like almost mirror the illustrations, have the poetry and the imagery mirror each other as like just another level of reading when you see the page because for me um admittedly enough I hadn't really read a book cover to cover in like, like years since school you know because I'm so so much into podcasting and audiobooks and watching videos for me like keeping my own attention and like understanding the youth and like younger people who like I would want to share my book with as well like sometimes you can barely get them to watch a 15 second clip on Instagram I'm at, let alone them read your entire book so for me I feel like the illustrations gave people and another entree um, and also keeping the poems pretty pithy in this book the all the poems are all they fit on one page uh, some of them are just you know four to six lines so I think that my whole goal here was to make each poem stand alone in the sense where you could read it and like it would provoke a question for you maybe like spark some type of curi curiosity but all together um, it would kind of be like a reckoning for people in a sense where it's like these are there are a lot of questions um, at the same time, someone could just flip flip it open, grab one, read one poem and sit down at the fireplace, drink their coffee and like dwell on that too. And I think that would be fine. I, I was hoping that it was able to do both. So that's a great question. Yeah, it's kind of like a, in certain situations, like a meditation and in other situations, like a conversation piece. So and even with just one poem, like you said. So um, I think that's a really neat kind of use for a poetry book that maybe people wouldn't immediately think of. Um, we do have a question for Matt. Uh, you are a teacher of English, like your bio mentioned. Uh, we're curious, what have you learned from teaching that informs your writing? If anything, I suppose I should say. <laughs> oh, it's a lot, but it's weird. Uh, again, potential long question. Um, I cited like books that I had taught and that kind of coincided for me, um, I guess with the short answer being sort of like exploring my atheism more diligently. Um, and so the content of like what I was reading definitely influenced this book. But in general, what's weird is I've taught creative writing, not my whole career, but about 13 out of the 17 years. And I tell people this, and it sounds kind of offensive to the students at first, but you learn a lot about writing from reading bad writing. Um, because like when you're troubleshooting with a student, about how to fix just the most basic parts of why their story stinks. Um, you, you, you basically are forced to contemplate and deconstruct like, okay, they're not where you know, they should be. What can I tell them to just get the ball rolling in a positive direction? And so, yeah, I found whether it's, there's a couple handfuls of students that I just, they were better than me. I've learned from them, of course, uh, over the years. Um, but then mostly it's just having those conversations and 
the quick moment in my head where I'm like, uh, how do I answer that question? And you gotta, you gotta think of something. And then of course, a lot of times you run into the same issues over and over again. So the repetition kind of helps reinforce that. Oh, that's apparently a key component. Um, so yeah, I think it's just, it's like deconstruction and minimalism. Um, it just, yeah. And then it's just all through diffusion as well. Like you just can't help, but like learn when you're reading stories, sharing stories, talking about stories. And yeah, so a lot of it's probably unnamed knowledge that I just don't really know that I have, but mm. it obviously coincides with my growth as a writer. So it's got to have something to do with it. Yeah. I have to say as a teacher of music, that totally, that whole answer really resonated with me. Both the like, you know, some things are reinforced, like you have to keep teaching them, but also I think people are surprised, you know, students can really surprise you with um, something you've thought about and you've never thought about in a certain way. So um, love to hear that from uh, another teacher, of course. Um, we've got a question from Damien to Alan. Um, and I love this question because I love talking about titles. Did you start with the name Balsamic Moon for the book or did you tease the title out through the writing? I definitely did not start with that title. Um, I, uh, my characters spent several nights trapped in an attic without the benefit of electricity. And I wondered how dark the sky was that night. What was the phase of the moon? Um, were there lots of stars out? Was it cloudy? Because uh, it could be pitch black, it could have a full moon and you could see fairly well. Well, I looked it up, the phase of the moon corresponded in an astrological book to a balsamic moon. I had never heard of that. So I did a little research, found out, and uh, found out that it was an ominous time of uh, astrological change and um, a time of endings and a time of even destruction. And it seemed to dovetail quite a bit with the story and the happenstance, which was a real occurrence. And that's where the title came from. Mm. Thank you, Damien. Um, another question now to Damien from <clears throat> Matt. What were the conversations like with your illustrator? I'm interested in those kinds of collaborative artist conversations. Yeah, so we had a great working relationship because I think that we both appreciate the creative process. So I gave him a lot of space to be creative. Um, so I basically sent him poems and he would send me sketches and we would talk about kind of like the initial sketches. Um, I might have some direction, but I really like wanted to give him the freedom to, when, when I approached him with the project, I said, hey, this is like half of your book. You know, like I know my name's on the front of it, but in content, I mean, half of it is literally illustration. So um, I wanted him to feel like he could craft his own narrative in whatever space he was able to do that in this book. And so we had mostly just like check-ins. I pretty much let him do his thing. Um, and I didn't, I, I wrote all the poems and he made illustrations based on the poetry. We went back and forth a couple of times. I was like, hey, I had a different idea. You know, there's one, for instance, where the there's a concept I'm talking about that's like an abacus. And I really wanted there to be an actual abacus in the drawing. And he had made something else. And I was just like, hey, I, I think for this one, even if it's more on the nose, it's just more in line with what like I see next to the page. And like we had those moments, but for the most part, I also wanted him to bring whatever he could bring. So like the little character, even the character that's on the front of the book, that was his original idea. So for me, like being able to, if I would have told him, hey, I want you to make the cover like this, I wouldn't have got that character. You know, you know, I wouldn't have got that that drawing. Um, so I think that for me, those that's the best way for me to collaborate with with artists is just us relying on each other's expertise. And, you know, if we have to go head to head in those like tough or just decisive moments, that's fine. But for the most part, I think that when you can trust the people you're working with, then the best work just comes out of everyone doing their thing to their best ability and you guys pulling it all together. So that's what I was I was trying to listen to you and kind of have one eye on the picture to imagine what I would have pictured if I didn't have the picture. And that kind of interaction was fun. But yeah, it's I like the idea of words informing pictures and pictures informing words and that kind of back and forth is cool. 
Yeah. Very cool. I also liked what I wanted to, if I had, if I could, I wanted to say something about what Alan, what Alan said too. People have said to me like, oh, it's time to break out the dictionary or the thesaurus or something from like certain words I've chosen in the book. And it's funny to me because just how Alan said he didn't know what a balsamic moon was. There are certain words I didn't necessarily know what they meant before I started writing this book. But for me, it's like, well, you have to still find the most appropriate word to get across the meaning. And so I learned some words, you know, along the way. And I think that's such a cool thing. I've never heard I've never really heard authors talk about that. You just kind of seem like the guy with the great vocabulary. Um, but I think it's like super fun to know that we're all still learning along this way. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that ongoing learning process can be just like a really fun part of being a writer, to be honest. So I'm also happy to hear you guys talk about that. You know, one thing that I had to do is I had to make sure I knew how to say some words because I looked them up <laughs> and I knew what they meant. But I didn't know, like for practicing readings, like I was like, oh, I better not sound like an idiot when I finally read that. <laughs> I feel like that's such a classic, like, um, you know, you grow up reading a lot. And so you see a word and you just kind of gloss over it <laughs> when you're reading and you learn like 10 years later. I actually don't know how to pronounce contemplative or contemplative or however it goes, you know. <laughs> um, I wanted, uh, I had a question that I wanted to pose to Alan real quick. Um, I know that you came to writing this novel from a background of a lot of short story publications. Um, so I'm curious, was it difficult to make the transition from short form to long form? Uh, it's just a different animal. Um, difficult and, and in some ways, yes, um, because you have to um, perhaps take a moment and create breathing space in between things happening. Uh, short stories are much more concise and require that every word matter. Um, novels allow a little more license and a little more breathing space, as I said. Um, I find short stories actually more difficult um, just because uh, of the precision. In a way, it's sort of like poetry. Uh, in poetry, every word matters. You don't have the right to, or the opportunity to have throwaway, tossaway lines, um, where you just go for something or explore something because you feel like it. It has to matter, and it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end in a very confined space. Um, so um, it was difficult, and it was also uh, easier in a way, too. Yeah. I, I find it difficult to actually express how how the how to shift from one another, but that they are different. Mm, I guess we'll all have to try both <laughs> and make that comparison. There you go. See how it holds up. There you go. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I think uh, we're about at that. Oh, we have. Okay, I'm gonna ask this one last question, <laughs> and then we can um, sort of wind down. But one last question, another one for Alan. This one's from Matt. Oh. Um, how do you imagine your novel being read by those who have lived in New Orleans versus those who haven't? That's a very interesting question. And hopefully it's not being read aloud <laughs> because I find that very difficult and anxiety producing. Um, I, you know, I, I would hope that they would see that it comes out of a great deal of respect for the city and its people and that, um, they would know that um, it helps to memorialize what they went through. It's just one little contribution. There's so many. Uh, there's an HBO uh, program right now, Five Days in Memorial, about uh, people at uh, Baptist Memorial Hospital and the decisions they had to make about patients when their electricity went out. Just how difficult it was for the people who remained in town. and I. I hope that what they see is that it came out of love and concern. Mm. Yeah, part, of, part of the reason I asked that question is because as soon as I read your book description, Alan, I uh, have a friend who lives in LA now, but they lost their home in Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina. And so they're a transplant. And I just forwarded your book to him. I was like, hey, it sounds like it's right up your alley. So it's kind of like my Thank you, one New Orleans resident person that I'm close to. So. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think I think adversity and 
uh, learning to uh, step a little bit outside of your comfort zone and work with people who are different than you, um, who come from different backgrounds, different uh, angles, different ideas, um, is something we all should uh, do more often. And New Orleans is a city that asks you to do that frequently. So uh, thank you for sharing it with your friends. All right. And with that, now this time, <laughs> I think we're about ready to wind down. So um, thank you really, Matt, Alan, Damien, for being with us and sharing your words. And um, obviously this, this kind of background to your writing and your processes. Um, and thank you to everyone who was able to make it out today. Um, don't forget that you can order Icarus Never Flew Round Here. Balsamic Moon, and I Made a Place for You from the links in the chat. And you can also consider checking out atmospherepress.com to browse our new and forthcoming releases, to sign up for our email newsletter, or to submit a book manuscript of your own. Feel free to submit your work to books at atmospherepress.com and let us know that you attended today's event. But until then, we'll look forward to hearing from you and have a festive December, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Hela. Nice to meet you guys, Damien and Alan. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you as well. Thank you.